Hello everyone and welcome to a brand new series called Dwarfs vs the World and in this series I will be breaking down the Dwarven faction discussing a variety of topics these topics will include army and unit breakdowns, game tactics, how to break down the Dwarven builds, individual matchups and how to prepare for the multiplayer battles however in today's episode I will be discussing the Dwarven faction as a whole and I will discuss the pros, cons, lords, heroes and individual units so that being said, let's hop into the overalls. We'll look at good, bad, and some of the things you should take into consideration, and that should nicely lead us through there to the Lord's Heroes and all of the units. There's something we have to take, and when we think here about the Dwarfs, um, let's go through the good first. We'll say that the, um, in general, you say overall for all the unit categories, so we've got infantry, missile infantry, artillery, etc. You would say overall they're better than average compared to most other factions. They have a very high cost efficiency, probably some of the highest in the game here for especially infantry and range. They're very good here with longbeards with some phenomenal stats that we'll go through later. Uh, and in general here for the dwarfs, what you need to know is they're going to be very heavily armoured, high leadership, high melee defence and durable. They're very, very durable indeed. They can sustain, especially front lines, they're very good for sustaining for very long durations of time. And that's pretty good for new players as it allows for there to be a lot less micro as a lot of units aren't going to be routing too often. But on the flip side of things, um, for the overall bad things, you generally say they have, well, the biggest thing is lack of mobility. Although they're going to be better overall on average, they're all very slow, and therefore mistakes can be very costly, and you generally find with that you find very particular one-dimensional builds. Um, and you also find that this sort of is, is all out or nothing really. You find that most people either go like sort of an onion build or a bit of a box build. You can see gyrocopter spams where you see sort of a sky force, but in general you see all or nothing and you see very repetitive builds. That being said, it's not boring either, but other things they do struggle with is like for example no cavalry, no monstrous infantry, therefore they sort of struggle to pin in any uh, important units. They do have some, so for example giant slayers here, they have very good mass, good armor piercing, anti-large as well. They, are, they have a good potentiality there to box in certain units, but unfortunately uh, there's not many, there's far and few between for sure. Uh, they also have no magic, but they do have a good rune system that has been recently changed here with the brand new FLC and DLC here. Uh, but of course, they don't have the variety of magic you could get for, say, in the High Elf roster. And the last thing as well is they're very prone to cycle charging. Um, in, in general, they, 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 apart from all the slows they have, for example, flash bombs and the Ruin of Sonus, they have ability to stop these items and they can shoot them or use Slayers to take care of them. In general, they're very susceptible to getting run over by big single entity monsters, chariots, all of these large elements. And with a lack of melee output as well, they do really struggle to hit back against these entities. They generally have very high melee defense, but not very good melee output. So you are relying heavily there on runes and also you're relying heavily on your range, which of course is going to be the key fundamental target for most people to shut down against the dwarves. So moving on there, we're going to move into some of the lords and heroes and those discussions, but when it comes before that, we have to take into consideration an overall pick and ban system for the dwarves. When it comes down to pick and bans, dwarves are either very, very good against factions, or they're not very good against factions. So for example, they have a very lopsided match setup. So very good, they're very good against the Empire, very good against Vampires and Bretonia. They're very good against those. They're, they're, they're almost must bans for those factions. So they, you'll find that Bretonia, Vampires and Empire almost ban Dwarfs every single time, if not all the time. And on the flip side, uh, the Dwarfs are always going to be banning certain ones as well. So that's going to be Skaven, High Elves, Beastmen are three that come to mind. There are three must bans here for the Dwarfs. Uh, simply because they have entities within their rosters that the Dwarfs really do struggle to deal with. So when we, move through, when we move forward here to the units, lords and heroes, we're going to take some of those concepts into consideration and why certain lords and heroes are selected over others, why some heroes are a must or they're just never seen at all, and why units here synergize better with others. So if we move on here to the lords, um, this, might, this, this is down to a little bit of opinion as well, but here what I say is my opinion through my experience in my mailing of the faction. I pretty much say I play Dwarfs 90-95% of all battles I do. Uh, they're my favourite faction by far and they're the ones I'm by far the best with. But I would say without doubt uh, Thoric Ironbrow is by far the best. Um, 
He is the newest uh, DLC, or shall I say FLC Lord here in the game. Uh, he is pretty much a reskin of the Rune Lord, but far and above improved. He's so far and above improved that the fact that you'll probably never ever see a normal Rune Lord again. Uh, until there's been some changes here within Warhammer. So he has the, he has the access for an Anvil of Doom, which you'll always almost see him on, and we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. He also has some great abilities here with Forge Fire, so that's a Nick of 15 armor and a 40 meter radius. Uh, immune to Psychology, which is really important, so that Fear and Terror can't affect your leadership, uh, with Fear being a base negative 8 leadership, and obviously Terror having the ability to Terror out. Uh, we also have the Master of the Ancient Law, which means as long as he's engaged in melee combat, he will be getting his runes back quicker. So essentially, he can be using their equivalent of magic a little bit more often. He has a wide variety of runes. All six runes are available. They're the same for him as they are for the Rune Lord and the Runesmith. They're all the same. So we used to have Master Runes and uh, the normal runes, but now we just have runes. They're just, it's all the same throughout. And then his item, which is, is, is decent, which is the Thorax Rune Armor. So it gives plus 15 armor and flame resistance in a 40 meter radius. So as we go through here, let's discuss it a little bit. So we do have the Anvil of Doom. Now, what does this offer him? It's 400 cost. It offers him nearly 1,000 health. It gives him increased leadership. It doesn't reduce his speed, but he's, he's pretty slow anyway. Dwarfs are, as we said, overall slow. But it's also going to offer him melee defense and charge bonus. Now, for anyone that has a little bit of an eagle eye, you'll also notice down the bottom there, you'll see a little white symbol. That white symbol there is going to be physical resistance. Now, he's going to offer him an extra 25 physical resistance. So what does that percentage mean? That means all melee attacks or range attacks that do come in up against Thorgrim, he will negate automatically 25% of successful damage that goes into him. And being he's going to be on a massive Anvil of Doom, which actually makes him large compared to being a normal size, is, uh, is pretty nice considering he's got 50 melee defense. He's pretty chunky, 120 armor as well, even more if he's got uh, the Thorax Rune armor. And also you can partner that with an overcasted Rune of Oath and Steel for the extra 60 or 30 if it's normal as well. So you're talking anywhere up to 195 armor. So that's, uh, that's exceptional levels of armor there. So yeah, also it gives him access to probably the most powerful thing currently in the Dwarven roster, which is this rune here. So this is the Rune of Doom. This is why you will never ever see a Rune Lord again. It's because with the Rune of Doom, it gives you a map-wide plus 24 melee attack and it also causes fear. Well, can cause fear. Which means you also give a negation of negative 8 leadership, which Dwarves do not have any access to. Now, in regards to this, this can be popped for 16 seconds every two minutes. So every two minutes, you basically get very, very powerful dwarfs. You can also partner that up with runes. For example, if we go here with the rune of speed, that's a plus melee attack and plus speed. So it could be very good when used in front lines, especially when they want to hold or you want to put some more damage output in a certain area. Let's say there's an elite unit there. You can pop the rune of speed in a 40 meter radius and just really helps you hold that line. So that rune there is not available on the Rune Lord. So when you get the Rune Lord, he, he does get that physical resistance, that 25%, but he doesn't get the Rune of Doom. That is only there for Thoric Ironbrow. So regardless here, so it's 2,250 as the base with all of the runes. Whereas if we go with Thoric, he's going to cost an extra 200, but at the same time, that Rune of Doom is more than worth it. It's faction-wide. All of your units get plus 24 melee attack, which is huge for the dwarves, as they're very known for having a very low melee attack. As we can see here, we use Longbeards as an example. They have 30 melee attack, 48 melee defense, so very high melee defense, good armor there, 100, good leadership. That nearly doubles the melee attack there from the Longbeards. Even though it's only 16 seconds, that's going to be all the units that are fighting in combat. So that's a very nice buff there for the Dwarves, and something that they really lack on, and it's a good hole to fill with Thoric. So with Thoric in the current meta, you're almost going to be seeing him, you'll probably see him 90% of the time. I think you'll very rarely not see Thoric because of all the abilities it has. And most of the time you'll see two runes. And the reason is the rune system has changed a little bit more to a magic based, um, a magic type based element where if you cast a rune, it takes a minute before that rune comes back. And if you overcast a rune, which you can overcast them now, it'll take two minutes to come back. So you have the ability to increase the duration of time, or with some of them it might be go from, if you overcast it, it goes to 60 armor instead of 30. And uh, what happens is, is when you cast a rune, you then can't use another rune for another 60 seconds. And if you overcast a rune, you can't use another rune for 60 seconds, but you also can't use that rune for another two minutes. So, you know, there are pros and cons to overcasting and not overcasting, etc. 
So what you'll see here is you can also see multiple runesmiths partnered together. Now in the current multiplayer scene you can only have, I believe it's one of the same runes. So for example here if Thorok brings one rune, um, other runesmiths can only bring the other runes essentially. So you could have something like this where you have two runes in the middle and then you bring the two runes on the end. And they're, they're, they're not all the same. So if Thoric casts a rune, the other two can cast as well. So if two of them cast, the other one can cast, and they can constantly keep casting runes. But you've got to just you've got to decide for yourself, is that worth the cost of the runes? So some of these runes are good, and some are going to be great in some matchups, and not so great in others. So that overall is Thoric. I think Thoric has the ability here to be incredible. Um, he can give immune to psychology, he gives negative armor, he can increase the armor of units around him, he can give resistances, he has runes that buff front lines where they have particularly strong weaknesses, for example melee attack, and uh, overall he's just exceptionally durable, has magic attacks as well, and uh, good armor piercing. So he's probably the best choice here you have for the dwarfs, and uh, we'll move through. So. Probably the next best is going to be uh, Ungrim Iron Fist, and the reason Ungrim Iron Fist is probably the next best is simply because of nerfs to Grombrindle, but we'll move on to Grombrindle soon, but since Grombrindle got nerfed, he was the top choice, but um, since all of some items have been removed for him, he has dropped down the list pretty heavily. So as we move through here to Ungrim, we'll see that uh, on naked, so meaning with no items or abilities, he's 1250. He has lots of armor piercing, good armor, uh, he has perfect leadership there with unbreakable, so he'll never run until he dies, and he has very, very good anti-large stats. So he's very good at taking down large single entity monsters, and of course he's unbreakable, so getting rid of him is not easy. He's very durable, he's going to stay to the end, and overall, good melee attack, relatively decent melee defense, He's just an exceptional model for 1250 gold cost. He's just also very slow. So you, if, if you really want to, you could invest into Foe Seeker. That will put him up to 40 speed. Um, so, you know, it can make him relatively fast, but um, it, it's in general up to you. You'll see most people bring him naked. That's where you get the most value from him. But uh, some people might bring the Axe of Darko. It gives you extra armor piercing and extra bonus plus large if you have a particular single entity monster that's heavy on the armor and, like, has loads and loads of health. You know, so you can always bring him against something like that. I say probably the third choice for the cheapness is probably Belagar Ironhammer. Most people don't take any of these items because they're not particularly worth the cost. Uh, Rally's probably not worth the cost. I, I don't see anybody or I don't bring the Mighty Oath Bone. I've seen some bring Revenge Incarnate, but for that 240 cost, I don't think it's particularly worth it compared to what you can spend on other units. So for example, that's halfway towards spending on a unit of Dwarf Warriors, which will be very good and we'll probably get more value than you get from the 238 you get just from a single entity. Other than that, he has his Hammer of Ungrand, which is decent, but obviously when it drops below 50% leadership, that goes. So I find that when most units that have these type of items, when they drop below 50% leadership, they just kind of fall off, because everything that was great about them, everything you've paid for them to keep them fighting, just sort of falls off the end. So I don't particularly think that's worth it either. But he's nice and cheap. The reason he falls below Ungrim Iron Fist is the fact that he's not unbreakable, but he has good stats, 60 melee defense, 60 melee attack. He's silver shielded, 120 armor. I think his best place is probably against something like the Empire, where they have lots of guns and crossbows. He's very tanky, very durable, very, very cheap, and allows you to go super wide. That extra 250 gold can, you know, buff you from some Dwarf Warriors up to Longbeards, for example. So that's where going a little bit cheaper sometimes can benefit you in that. And it, it all depends on what your outcomes are, and we'll go through that as the series goes on. After that, it's a bit of a mishmash. Um... The rest of the lords here, they're the three main ones you see. It'd be 90% Thoric Ironbrow probably, and then 10% between these two. The rest of them aren't really seen, and we'll, we'll touch on Grumbrindle. It's a bit of a sad story for him, unfortunately. Um, Tenori Whitebeard has, has seen some love, and then all of a sudden got that love ripped away from him very quickly. So the way it went is Grumbrindle got some changes to him that actually gave him Unbreakable. So he never used to be Unbreakable, but then a couple of patches ago he got Unbreakable and that was amazing for him. He became exceptional and he also had the ability Flash Bomb. So we'll go here. So Flash Bomb gives that negative speed and negative melee defense. And on top of Gombrindu, who has 70 melee attack, 500 armor piercing weapon strength, magic attacks as well, lots of armor, he's Unbreakable. It was just awesome to have on him. He could pretty much flash bomb something and then just delete it. And uh, you can have some slayers nearby and you could just, just delete anything large or any specific foot hero that you wanted to delete. And he would do massive damage exceptionally quickly. His only drawback was his low 45 melee defense where he also took a lot of damage from good duelists in return. But 
since the newest update here for the FLC from the Silence and the Fury, he's lost Flash Bomb. It got given to the Master Engineer, and the only thing that Grumboodle has left is the fact that he's unbreakable and causes magical attacks. Um, he does have Grumboodle, has no fear, but that's been nerfed down to a 55 meter radius. It is nice, it, it does last 24 seconds, you can only use it once. Um, so it's, its use is okay, it's free, but it is built into his cost. I'd actually rather see them strip that and have the option to take it or not take it. I think that would actually make him a little bit more competitive because, in my opinion, it's actually not that great. Um, him costing 1.6k is just is way too expensive, and if you want a Magic Lord that's always going to do better, you just take Thoric Iron Brow. And the reason you might take Magic... Um, magic heroes, you know, with good melee attacks, is the dwarves really struggle with magic. So, let's say we take an ethereal unit, they normally have very high physical resistance. Somewhere in the region about 75%, which means all melee attacks will have 75% negation to all damage if they have a successful hit. So, if they hit for 100 damage, they'll only do 25 damage, which over time is really large. Whilst magic damages here from melee attack will 100% hit through that as it counts as a magic attack. So that physical resistance basically becomes null and void and all ethereal units basically have no armor. So you're going to hit very, very hard there. So you have him, you have Thorgrim and we have the Peak Gate Guard. So those three were the old school before we had Thorak Ironbell. They were the only three entities alongside Gombrindle, apologies, that had magic damage. It was only those four. And Grumbrindle was always the best of that selection to bring, and normally along with the Peak Gate God Hammerers to deal with ethereal units, whether that's the, the Green Knight, whether that's Sirenes, whatever it may be. So essentially the only thing that Grumbrindle really has going left for him here is his magic, magic attacks. Uh, other than that, he's looking pretty sad and sorry for himself. He really doesn't have much going for him. Everybody else has more to offer and is generally cheaper. So... Yeah, so for example, if you bring Ungrim Iron Fist, he's going to be get better against large entity monsters. If you want somebody that's going to be more durable, it's going to be better against like Iron Hammer. And then I don't think there's a single thing that you've got. I, I don't think there's a single thing he's got that Thoric Iron Brow, apart from being unbreakable, there's nothing that he has to offer, I don't think. So then we move on to Thorgrim Grudgebearer. Now, I love Thorgrim Grudgebearer. I think the High King, um, I'm a massive Dwarf fan, so I love him in general. But he is just way too expensive for what he does. He did get some buffs, for sure. He uh, got a buff to his Great Book of Grudges. It went from 9 melee attack up to 10. So 55 meter radius. Plus 10 melee attack is huge for the Dwarfs. As we've already said, the melee attack is, is, is pretty low. So having that plus 10 melee attack is, is huge, right? Um, however, he does have Stand Your Ground, which is nice. You know, you get that ability here. So for example, if we take Belagar, he only has Rally, and then he has basically uh, the Mighty Earth Stone, so it's split over two. Whilst here we have it for one ability for a much cheaper cost for Stand Your Ground. So that's really nice. And the Oath of Vengeance, which is 44 seconds of negative 24 melee attack, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a long time. It's, it's, it's a really nice ability, actually. Uh, most people drop Foe Seeker. It's not really that important. And uh, the High King. Um, I don't know how I feel about this. Um, so essentially the, the way this works is when he drops below 50% uh, base health, so he's got 5,800. So when he, when he drops below 2,900 health, it, his entire faction, so map-wide, gains plus 8 melee attack, 15% base weapon damage, charge, and immune to psychology. Now the main one there is the immune to psychology, or the ITP, is, um, is huge. That is good. That means that fear, terror is all, all gone. It's very good against uh, the undead factions, and it's also very good up against large entity monsters. Uh, so overall it's good, so obviously you're getting that melee attack in again where dwarves struggle with weaknesses, but it, it's it's very expensive, and he's very expensive, and bringing all of these items, he's costing 2,100, he's very durable, he's got 62 melee defense, 125 armor, but that's pretty much all he offers. Um, this, this, he has good like 40 and 55 meter radius, so basically you have to fight a blob around him to, to get all of his benefits, and even then he's really, really expensive. He's over double the cost of an Aka Belagar, um, nearly almost double the cost of an Unger of Iron Fist. You know, if you bring all of his items, he, he's really expensive. And I generally don't think you get the value from him, or he doesn't aid in the value from him himself and all of his items, um, compared to what you get from somebody else. So, for example, in most builds, you're going to want a Master Engineer for that Flash Bomb. So, that's an extra 800 cost. Whilst you could get for the same price as just Thorgrim on his own, you could get a Naked Ungrim 
and a master engineer for the same cost as Dolgrim and you're getting a slow. So for that same cost there, so the same cost of all of it, you can now also get a runesmith. Where you can bring, say, the rune of slowness and the rune of speed. So you're then also getting extra bonuses and then you could bring his fire ring atori, 20% fire weakness for example. And all of these elements in here for the same cost as all of them together, you're now getting two heroes and Ungrim, whereas before you're only going to get Thorgrim for the same cost. So that's why I generally don't think he's particularly worth it. Um, he's going to be costing that extra, what, that nearly that extra 1,000, which essentially you could get yourself a good unit of the Grumbling Guard or maybe two units here of Dwarf Warriors that could really aid in that front line a little bit more, in my, in my personal opinion. So I think he's always been way too expensive for what he does. Uh, the Rune Lord you're never going to see because uh, if you're going to bring the Rune Lord, you might as well bring Thoric Ironbrow. And then we have the Lord. So the Lord is good. Um, he's very cheap. 900 cost with no items. Stats are okay. Not brilliant. He has Silver Shield. Uh, he does have Expert Charge Defense. But when compared to Belagar Iron Hammer, Belagar is going to have an extra 800 health, which is huge. Uh, extra melee, melee attack. Extra leadership. Plus 30 weapon strength. He also goes from Bronze to Silver Shield. And he also has the expert charge defense and all the extra stuff. And that's only going to cost an extra 100 when he's naked. So for the extra 100 cost, you're getting way and above what you paid for. So I just I just think it's it's much better. And items-wise, um, he does have a better item to so stand your ground. That is the one benefit he has over Belagar. Uh, he has this item entwined, which has melee defense and leadership. Whilst for Belagar, you'd need both of these to get the same effect. Now, you do get expert charge defense with the Mighty Earthstone. But um, I think what I'd rather do is make the Mighty Earthstone a blue rare item and just include Rally. I think that would make that the Mighty Earthstone way more broad and it would just make it a lot more competitive. So in general, that's the Lords. I think you're going to be seeing Thoric all the time and then Ungrim and Belagar. And the rest is pretty much not seen at all because in the sense of the game, value, etc. There is always better value to be had elsewhere. Now, if we go through here with the heroes, we'll start with the Thane. Uh, Thane got some move arounds, um, so we got some items removed. The Rune of Dismay is a brand new one. Uh, 40 meter radius, negative speed, negative charge speed, and negative charge bonus. It's only 10%. Um, so that's only really... I don't know. That's pretty much only going to have any real effect on... If it's partnered up with other slows, or maybe against melee infantry, if you're like in infantry chase, dwarves are so slow that 10% really isn't enough for it to have a benefit on much, I don't think. And also considering its cost at 140, it's just not worth it. Um, Silverhorn of Vengeance, Dowie are not known for having good charge bonus. Well, they have okay, I think. Like, it's okay, but I just, I, yeah, it's not worth it. Um, the Iron Bids Ring is a nice item uh, plus 20 percent weakness to fire there's a lot of fire causing units here in this roster we'll go through that later and you'll also see him fighting in the front line you'll see the thane in there fighting as well and um given that fire weakness so that's always quite nice uh, both of his items you have deadly onslaught and photo you can most people drop that at 580 or they drop the ring as well and he just goes cheap at 500 you can see the thing sometimes they're nice support here for cheap lords such as belagar you can go with the triple say against tomb kings or, or against tomb kings so it's a little bit better it's a little bit like this where they struggle to deal with like heavily armored single entities or you can see him against skaven i've seen that as well um, where this is quite nice, or the ability to snipe out um, certain lords and heroes, like uh, Belagar can be quite nice as well. Uh, but overall, you're not really going to see him too much, move on to the Runesmith for this reason. They actually copy and pasted an item over, which is the Iron Bids Ring. This never used to be on the Runesmith, it was solely attached to the Thane, and if you were doing a fire build, there's a bit of a meme, it's not competitive, but if you're doing a fire build meme, you would see uh, the Iron Bids Ring brought on some Thane, so that was a nice single element to bring on the Thane that nobody else had but unfortunately now the Thane has shared that ability now with the runesmith which is a shame because now now the runesmith can bring it so it means it's even less likelihood you're going to see the Thane but uh, runesmith is very nice of course you have all the options the runes and they're not regular runes and master runes they're all the same they offer the same abilities and they don't intertwine with the charge uptime of Thoric Ironbrow or or the rune lord so you can do one on Thoric and then do an immediate second rune here on the runesmith so they have separate um, uh, separate cooldowns so that's quite nice as well uh, we have the forge fire it's okay um, 132 cost is quite expensive for negative 15 armor um, I probably wouldn't recommend it. All these all these elements here you're adding up, so if you bring Forge Fire 
It doesn't stack, so it's not going to be negative 30 if you have two forge fires. If it has the same name and it's the and the same ability, they don't normally stack on top of each other. So um, unfortunately here, just taking one or none at all is probably advised. So lastly, we have the Master Engineer, and you're probably going to see this in... You'll see at least one in 95% of builds. Uh, we'll get to that reason in a minute why, but uh, you'll often see a build a little bit like this. Some with the Firing Atori, some not. So they have the Prospector Spyglass, which has increased accuracy for all units around them in a 40 meter radius. In general, for the Dowie, they have the highest accuracy for ranged units and artillery in the game. They are the most accurate that Warhammer has to offer. So etcher accuracy on the most accuracy or the highest accuracy units in the game. You can decide if you think it's worth it. I don't think it's worth 150 cost, in my personal opinion. And that's the same here for... I've seen a lot of people bring ballistics calibration, which has increased reload speed and accuracy. It is very high, but for 150 cost, is it really worth it? I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced. I would rather save on those two items and get myself a unit of mine as a blasting charge, or at least two-thirds the weight of that, than uh, spending my cost on that. So one thing you will see is restock. That's the ability to have four restocks. I believe is up to 50% ammunition you can gain back. If I'm correct, I could be wrong on that. But uh, you can gain up to 50% back from one restock on any ranged unit. Or somewhere between 25 and 50%. So you can use that four times on any units. And Dawi are almost indefinitely always going to bring range. So getting range back for your Thunderers. Or getting back for your Gyro Bombers, Gyrocopters. It's all very valuable, and it's actually really nice here considering you also have ranges of great weapons. They only have 12 ammunition, so getting that ammunition back is going to be really nice for those units that have a very low ammunition pool. Now, the reason you see the Master Engineer a lot is because of this. We've already discussed it, the Flash Bomb. The Flash Bomb has not only been changed and improved, but it's just really, really good here in the current multiplayer. So it gives a nick to 24 melee defense and a slow. And the slows are what are super important here for the dwarves. You'll normally see a partnership of the flash bomb mixed in here with the rune of slowness. And the reason is because the dwarves are such a slow faction, they are what we call a reaction faction. So with with the dwarves, and you normally, if you have an aggressive faction, they normally instigate where the attacks are going to go. So if you're rushing, you're going to be rushing on a particular part of the army, and then as the dwarves, because you're slow, you just have to react to what your player is doing. If you have Runa Slowness and Flash Bomb, you can slow down certain entities and then you can in inevitably pick the fight you want to pick. Whilst in the front line, once you've generally set your army, your infantry front line is so slow that you actually can't move from one side to the other easily and pick what units you want to fight against certain units. You might not always have that choice. And especially if you have high mobility, you're always going to be able to pick what fights you want to take. So having the ability to slow down units, uh, reduce their melee defense as well, uh, and be able to pick the fights you want to pick and give you more time to react and defend is, is invaluable here for the dwarves. So in the current meta, we're limited to two slows or, or one slow of the any same type. So you can't take two flash bombs. You can't take any two abilities. Uh, and I think you just can't take any two flash bombs. Apologies. You, can't, you can only take two, two of any of these three except a flash bomb. But you can take two slows overall. So the Rune of Slowness and Flash Bomb is almost always seen. Because it just gives you more time to react, as I said. So that's why you always see a Master Engineer in every single build, because this item is just so strong. And then we have Gotrek and Felix. Now, they are available, I believe, in the Empire roster and also the Bretonian roster. So you can get both of these guys almost in, in two other rosters. And what do they offer? They do offer some good stuff, especially if you want to... What's quite often seen is a triple threat, which is where you have two very strong heroes and a lord, which you see quite often in the Dwarven roster, because most lords are pretty strong. So you can go with Ungrim Iron Fist, which is quite um, commonly seen. And the reason it's quite commonly seen is because you have this ability here, which is called Blood Oath. So you get that here from Felix, which means when you're fighting in melee combat, he gives a restoration of 8 hit points per second. So as long as they're all fighting here together, he'll actually heal these entities whilst they're going. And for the Dwarves, you have no other option of healing. You cannot heal. There used to be some options previously, but there is none currently. And having Dwarves that are so durable, probably the most durable faction in the game, having the option to heal as well is huge. And it makes, it, makes, it makes a triple threat, you know, you can either bring Gotrek or you can bring a Thane or any really strong melee combat uh, hero or lord and having that healing and all the buffs, for example, helping hand, plus 40 melee attack, plus 40 damage resistance, 
and uh, all of the nice infantry items that he can bring um, just makes that tr that triple threat there super strong. Gotrek is also very nice. He's a very good anti-large slayer. He's a slayer hero, the same here as the Slayer King, Mr. Ungrim Iron Fist. Um, but he's going to be a naked slayer. So here for Ungrim Iron Fist, he's going to be the high. He's going to be the king. So he's going to have 120 armor. But here for Gotrek, he's going to be faster. 42 speed slayers are by far the fastest infantry that the dwarves have to offer. And uh, he comes with quite a few abilities. So defensively, he can bring the Gotrex Doom, which is plus 40 melee defense and plus damage resistance. And then you can pop Helping Hand on him as well, give that increased melee attack and 80% damage resistance, which is huge for himself because he has no armor. So that's essentially giving himself, in theory, um, like the ethereal status, if you like. Yep, so he has some nice abilities. He has Deadly Onslaught, Armor Piercing, Base Weapon Damage, and he can also come here with the Rune Axe of of Gotrek, which basically gives Dampen, which is a nice ability here, which reduces magic resistance on any items as he does magic damage and also increases armor piercing. So you'll see quite a lot of um, Lords and Heroes, like for example here the Dwarves have a base 25% magic resistance, faction wide, so he'll actually reduce that by 20%. So it also allows him just to punch that a little bit harder, which essentially... Um, essentially aids with those magic attacks and if they don't have the magic resistance then it gives them negative magic resistance that's also quite nice so they can be partnered up it's a little bit rare but certainly you can build a really strong triple threat that can could really throw off opponents and when they're together trying to you essentially need to try and see if you can snipe one and then all three generally tend to fall apart around it but um they they can be very invariably strong so we'll move on to the infantry and we've got quite a few elements of infantry here but most of them are a bit of a copy of themselves so you'll find here with miners you won't just have one unit of miner you'll have seven different variants of miners so well, the first one is we have just regular miners uh, they're not very good on their stats but they have as with all dwarves good leadership for their cost good armor and actually um, the nice thing about them is actually have vanguard deployment so if you want to do a little bit more of a dwarf push you can also vanguard them in specific areas and try and see if you can take your opponent unawares and the nice element about this unit as well is it has a good level of armor piercing. You'll see that little mark there that means they have good level of armor piercing. And they have 17 per model out of their base top, which is 22. So they do have some good elements about them, but their stats are relatively low. 20 and 18 is, is not particularly high. Uh, but obviously if you partner them up here with the Rune of Doom, and that's where the Rune of Doom finds its most value, is really wide builds they actually can get that to increase the stats there. So you can pop that when you first go into combat, and that actually over doubles their melee attack, goes from 20 to 44 there, which can really aid with miners. Extra ones you can get, you can get miners with the Blasting Charges, and you can get the Urkram Miners, which are the ROR Blasting Charges. Now, Blasting Charges, they're a uh, special uh, ranged weapon team, I guess, if you like. They're, so they're basically melee infantry that have special missiles. So they're going to have Blasting Charges that essentially... They're, they're, a, they're a massive explosion. So when they throw into lightly armored infantry, they cause a nice fire explosion that um, essentially anything with light armor takes truckloads of damage. It's a really good anti-infantry tool of doing lots of damage up against infantry very, very quickly on the approach. It has a very short range, 55 meter radius. And what it should do is it should break up the charge and it allows you to go in with them already pre-damaged before they've hit your front line. Now, this is a very commonly seen unit here for the, for the dwarfs. And it's one that I encourage you all to learn how to use. Um, the only one thing with the miners with the blasting charges, the one thing the blasting charges do struggle with is armor. So if anything comes up to you with a high level of armor, blasting charges really aren't going to do much up against armor. So you invariably want them going up against other cheap units and uh, getting value there from lowly armored infantry. It's very, very good at clearing out chaff. And the last unit is going to be the Urkra Miners, that's the ROR version, so that's the special version. You can only ever bring one of these here in the multiplayer scene. You can bring these, um, which do actually have three of the Blasting Charges, compared to the normal one here that you have from the normal Miners and Blasting Charges. Their missiles are also increased, and as you can see here, if we do actually increase the values up to the triple gold, the values actually become a little bit similar. But even at triple gold, you can see, even though they're more expensive, the ROR are going to have more blasting charges, and they're going to be a little bit stronger as well. That plus three there is uh, over 5% stronger, so it's still going to be still going to be pretty valuable there. They have pretty okay stats. They actually lost Frenzy in the most recent patch, which is a bit of a shame. Uh, I'm not really too sure why they had Frenzy in the first place, but losing it is also is a bit painful. 
So that's that's the uh, chief frontline unit you generally see. You don't you don't you don't invariably see miners at all. You normally bring miners and blasting charges and Urkram miners. And then we can move up to sort of the second tier infantry. So that's very cheap. And then we're just going. So we've got cheap units, and then we've got like intermediate units here, which is going to be the dwarf warriors and the dwarf warriors with great weapons. So dwarf warriors are sort of your bread and butter, uh, along with long beads here. They're, they're the two that you see quite a lot, also with miners. You see a combination of those three depending on who you're facing. So if you're facing uh, factions that invariably have cheaper front lines, uh, dwarf warriors will generally be okay. Uh, they have a very high melee defense, good armor, bronze shield, good leadership. Not brilliant melee attack, but they have they do they are very very durable. They also have uh, defense charge versus large, which means they're just going to be a little bit harder to push over if they they push from the front. And then they also have the armor piercing variants, where they'll lose certain stats, so they'll lose melee defense because they're going to lose those shields, etc. And they'll also lose the shields there from missile resistance. So they'll be losing that 35% missile resistance there. Uh, but they'll get just truckloads of armor piercing. So 23 per model out of 30 compared to the normal here, which will go down to 7. And then we have the ROR. So the ROR is going to be the same. They're not going to be the great weapon, but they're going to be just normal dwarf rods. But they'll be having flaming axes. They also come with anti-infantry, which means they'll get a multiplier versus infantry. And they'll be able to do lots of damage there and really clear out. And that's where we have the fantastic ring. So if we bring the ring in here. So it gives a fire weakness, which means when we fight here using the dwarf warriors or the Warriors of Dragonfire Pass here, they'll do extra damage there with those fire damages as everything around them in the 40 meter radius will be having that weakness. As long as they're here, along with the Runesmith, that is. So in very, these are very, very good units. They hold relatively well for their cost, and for 450, some of the best costs in the game uh, until we move on to the next unit. So this unit, in my personal opinion, is probably the most cost-efficient unit in the game, in my personal opinion. Uh, probably the one that comes closest to it is Probably Soros Warriors with Shields, I think. Um, phenomenal unit, 100 armor, 80 leadership, has, also has a bronze shield, uh, 48 melee defense, 30 melee attack, good levels of weapon strength as well. Uh, invariably, just a, a, an insane unit. It's just, it is a really, really good unit. And part alongside that, it also has Encourage as it comes from the old Grumblers. So it'll actually give leadership to uh, units around them. So essentially, in lore, um, the younger dwarfs don't want to run away from the longbeards because they'll never hear the end of it. So they essentially, essentially, they encourage dwarfs around them. So they give increased leadership as well. They have immune to psychology as a base, which means fear and terror don't affect them. And they also have that uh, charge defense versus large with obviously that base magic resistance. So overall, they're a very, very good unit. But of course, all these infantry have the same problem. They're uh, very slow. So they're very easy to either just go around or ignore, um, etc. And then we can move on to the Great Weapon Variety, same again, extra armor piercing, and then we can go to the ROR, which is the Grumbling Guard. So as you can see here, good stats overall, nice bonus, 90 leadership is huge, they still give that encourage, immune to psychology, defense charge versus large. They do lose the shield, unfortunately, but it's not the end of the world because they do grab the old Grumblers. Now what does this do? Now this increases vigor by 9%, which means anything in that 40 meter radius can never go to being exhausted. It'll always go to very tired, which means you can just keep that vigor up and means you can keep those melee attacks going a little bit of a faster rate and they're always going to do better in combat. Also as you go further down in the leaders as you go further down, sorry, in the vigor table, so if you go from very tired to exhausted, you'll actually lose the leadership as well. So it'll also help with leadership in turn. So you'll, you'll invariably see the Grumbling Guard stick around for very long. I've seen these units fighting at 200 health, balance of power against them, 7 units, and they're still fighting until the very end. Good armor piercing, and really good for support characters as well. They're really good when they work alongside heroes and lords, as they give that increased leadership to really help them fight as well. So invariably, I really like this unit. I think they're a very good unit. So yeah, Longbeard's probably some of the best units in the game, and these three here on the top, this top row, you'll see almost in every single matchup. You'll see some combination of these three. And then we're gonna move on to these units. So we're gonna move on to the Slayers. So Slayers are not a must bring, but they're a very strong unit here for the Dwarfs. As we can see, they're gonna have a base 40 speed. If we go against Longbeards, which are the slowest, 26, we're gonna be having 28 for Dwarf Warriors and minus 28 as well. So they're very slow in comparison. Uh, you know, obviously gathering quite a bit of extra leadership here. Slayers are very good anti-large tools. They're all unbreakable. They've all taken an oath where they'll fight to the death and they'll fight against anything until they die. 
So they have a truckload of anti-large. So plus 24 anti-large, good armor piercing, base weapon damage is, is very good. 48 weapon strength, 38 melee attack. So it's one of the few units here for the doors that has a good melee attack output as well. And of course they're unbreakable. So they'll fight to the very, very last model. They're very good at dealing with slayers. Uh, sorry, they're very good at dealing with cavalry. And uh, yeah, they're just they're invariably just very good units. The one thing they do really struggle against is they they do struggle against getting shot. They have they have no armor, so they they invariably die very quickly. So we also have the Dragonback Slayers, and this is another a really cool unit that I love here for the dwarfs, which is where they have physical resistance as an added compared to the normal. But they also come in here, which is the power of the Dragonback, which actually gives a negative thirty five percent speed and a fire imbued weakness, whilst also giving themselves a fire resistance. But they have to be engaged in melee to give that. So it means anything they're fighting in melee will also slow. Give a fire weakness so they can be partnered up with a few different items. So it's negative 20% there. If you bring in the ring, that's negative 40%. So you can partner them up as a three here and you can see how this is going. You could have Warriors of Dragonfire Pass along with the Dragonback Slayers and the ring. And these Warriors of Dragonfire Pass, if they're infantry, they're just going to absolutely demolish infantry in that front line. That's for sure. So yeah, overall, these are very, very good units. Uh, good speed. Uh, invariably faster. They're also very good at chasing down ranged infantry. Uh, most ranged infantry is somewhere between 32 and 38, so invariably they can chase those down as well. So if they can't fire what's moving, uh, they're a very good tool here. And essentially they're actually Dowie cavalry, a way, is a way of thinking about them. And then we move on here to the Giant Slayers. So all of them are anti-large, but the Giant Slayers have these great axes, which means they have a truckload of armor piercing, 50 weapon strength as well. Anti-large is actually increased for them. And they also have an increased mass and much greater melee attack as well. So 38 over here, 48 for the ROR, but for 1200 here is 48 base. So it's very nice here from these guys. Good charge bonus and good resistances. And they're just exceptional at dealing with chariots, essentially. They're, they're one of the only tools we have here from the Dwarfs for pinning in cavalry, chariots, flash bombs. So what most people do is they'll flash bomb a chariot, they'll move the uh, Dragonback Slayers in, truck loads of damage, and they'll also pin them into shape so we can deal with them and remove them from the battlefield. So invariably here, Slayers are seen in the majority of builds. They're very good indeed. Uh, the problem with them is they are very susceptible to being removed. And that is the problem with the Dwarfs is... As much as they are excellent, they are very easily countered. So you do have to be careful when you bring them, and you have to know what elements on the battlefield can remove them. And one of the giant weaknesses here is going to be ranged. Cheap range, cheap white range, just destroy slayers. And now we're going to move on to the really elite stuff. So we have the Peak Gate Guard and Hammerers. So Hammerers are an amazing tool. Really good damage dealers, fantastic armor piercing and good armor. They don't have any shields, but they have these ginormous hammers and truckloads of armor piercing. So they've got 41 armor piercing out of 55. Good magic resistance as base and good melee attack. They're pretty much the only infantry apart from Slayers that have good melee attack and good AP output. They are very expensive. They did go up in cost from 1100 to 1200, but they also got an increase in their melee attack as well. Uh, Peak Gate Guard are the same, but they come with magic. It's the only other magical element here from infantry that we have, other than Lords and Heroes. Also has armor sundering, so negative 30 armor and truckloads of armor piercing yet again. So really good uh, anti infantry tools. And uh, yeah, very good base leadership as well. You can supply these alongside Thorgood and Grudgebearer, and they're just lawn mowers. They just absolutely remove front lines, no problem. And then the last unit here. So these are basically going to be miners with blasting charges on steroids. Uh, we have the Kingsguard Iron Breakers. These guys are just exceptional. Um, fantastic. As you can see here, 49. Uh, missile strength compared to the normal miners which come in at 36 so they're already stronger they also get two per model and they have they are they are the most durable unit uh, infantry in the game by far um, as we can see here iron breaker 66 melee defense 125 armor they actually share the armor here with the uh, troll hammer torpedoes and any of the iron drake units they all share the same armor um, and as you can see here expert charge defense uh, which means that when bracing, they can negate charge bonuses, which is really good against cavalry, etc. And they have good magic resistance. Lots of melee defense, good blasting charges, very good at getting rid of cheap chaff, and then just moving through to block up against all that elite stuff. 
which is uh, which just makes them invaluable here because essentially when it comes to the dwarfs your infantry is not going to be the units that are going to put out the damage output they're going to hold so that your range can really fire through and get all of that damage there and the last unit is going to be the Norgrimlings Iron Breakers. These are the most elite of the elite that the dwarves have to offer, which have 79 melee defense, which is huge. And their missile strength goes from 49 up to 62, which is also just some, some awesome stuff. So they're also going to get a 43 melee attack. They've got a buff in the last one, but they also got an increased cost, so take it how you like. And they've got very, very good leadership. 95 leadership as base is, is, is pretty much as close to unbreakable as you can get. You'll see most unbreakable units have 100 leadership. They've got 95, so pretty much as close as you can get. Also, they've got 90 models compared to uh, 75. I think if you're going to be going triple Iron Breakers, you almost always want to bring the Nor Grimlings Iron Breakers. They're just so good not to bring them. And the one sneaky difference that uh, a lot of people might not recognize here between the ROR's, so we'll look here as well, so we'll bring both of these in. So one thing between the Norgrimlings and the Ironbreakers here is also the Norgrimlings have Vanguard deployment and also have immune to psychology. Now it would be the same here. So these two units will not have the immune to psychology, whilst the ROR's will both have immune to psychology. The only other units, which is why it makes Longbeard so great for their value, are Longbeard. They're the only other ones that don't uh, that have immune to psychology. Everything else does struggle with that from the Dwarf roster. That's where the Rune of Hearth and Home can come in here, which is quite handy for that 55 meter radius. But of course, you have to be in that radius. So you'll see quite a lot of builds from the Dwarfs that go against um, undead units that almost have imbued fear and then also terror. You'll see a lot of them bring in units such as, you know, such as these. You know, you'll see an army a little bit like this. That is pretty elite where they're able to have that immune to psychology where they're not going to get affected by undead units. So that's the infantry. Overall, it's relatively diverse. Um, you can go blasting charges to remove infantry. That's a pretty common tactic. You also have very durable units in the middle, very high melee defense, good armor, and they hold for an exceptional length of time, which is also quite good for new players, as you know, something, for example, having your front line breaking in the middle can be quite uh, can be quite difficult to micro, especially when you've got in that pocket, you've got lots of range you want to protect. If your front line's just buckling left, right, and center, the micro can be very difficult there to protect that middle pocket that's so important. So then we're going to move on to the missile infantry, and this changes a little bit here. So we have rangers, and the rangers here are going to change quite a little bit here. So we have four different types of rangers. So we have just the normal rangers, which are very nice. They have stalk, and they have vanguard deployment. So that stalk means that you have to get very close to them before you can see them. And uh, they have light armor, but they have good 160 range. Overall, pretty decent stats. Pretty much they're going to copy any other crossbow uh, missile infantry they're going to have relatively the same stats uh, good leadership um, okay melee stats nothing brilliant but overall pretty good cheap range and then we move on to the great weapons so these are going to be the same but they have truckloads of armor piercing they have throwing axes which have a much greatly reduced range but they are very very good at removing armored units they are exceptional they also have armor piercing uh, weapon strength as well if they come through with those great weapons, but they don't have any shields So they're not going to get any missile resistance. They also have stalk all range units have stalk Which is also quite handy and then we can move on to the ROR Ulthwar Raiders Now this is going to be a little bit of a sneaky snippet if you've got this far uh, Ulthwar Raiders by far in my opinion in the game are the best ROR for value for value that you can get anywhere I believe if we have a look here, we can see if we upgrade these to triple gold they cost 930. For the same here for the Ulthwar Raiders, we can see that they even get increased missile strength and an added ability, which we'll go through in a second, and they cost 180 less gold. So they're better, they're cheaper, and they come with added bonuses. So exceptional stuff, really good from them. So if we move on to the Ulthwar Raiders, they have this awesome ability called Marked by Ulthwar. There's a negative armor, negative missile resistance, and parry. So that there gives you ability just to pick a unit that you want to pretty much remove, and you can remove it. It gives it that negative missile resistance and armor, so throwing axes just do so much more damage. And you can also apply that there for blasting charges as well. So you can pop it on a unit, blasting charges counting as range. You can also just remove, you know, maybe mid-tier infantry. So with armor, let's say there's somewhere between 60 and 80, removing it by 30 is quite huge, and then blasting charges have way more of an effect. So... Uh, and also that negative missile resistance as well, and remove shields, so it can it, it can really aid in the front line with blasting charges, or for example, lowly armor piercing units such as rangers. Rangers are very good up against chaff, but if you use marked by Ulthwar, it's the same as using an armor sundering. Um, it has it has a very nice uh, dual effect there. 
The larger unit is going to be the Bungman Rangers. Um, I think most people in the community like them, but they're too expensive for what they do. So they're basically going to be Rangers on steroids yet again. They are going to be having regeneration. It's the only unit in the game for the Dwarves that does. Uh, they have that four hit points per second, which is just constant all the time. Uh, it's only disabled if they start wavering or they break. Uh, they also have Stalk. The nice thing is they also have immune to psychology, so terror and fear doesn't work on them. They do have charge defense and vanguard deployment. So they're very, very durable. They're the most durable range we have here for the dwarves. They're just way too expensive. And a lot of matchups going with them is not always great. Um, yeah, I just think they're too expensive. Um, I think I'd rather take two units of rangers for 1,050 compared to one bugman. I think I'd always do that. Um, because I just think in general with the current meta, I think it's better. But uh, certainly here, Rangers of Grey Worms are also a very nice tool. I almost invariably, in most of my builds, bring the Alpha Raiders. I, I just think they're exceptional value. So then we can move on to Quarrelers. Quarrelers are also nice ranged units. You get two here, so you have the Quarrelers and then Quarrelers with great weapons. Um, as you can see here, if we compare them to the Rangers, uh, the main difference here you can see... Uh, let's click it the other way around. You can see there's going to be a negative to armor for the Rangers. Um, and then let's do it the other way around, actually. You can see it on the other way around. Other way around is a little bit more important. So you can see they have an added armor, added uh, leadership. They do have less speed because they've got more armor, of course. They have better stats as well with more ammunition. So for the extra 25 cost, it might seem a bit silly. Like for the extra 50, 25 cost, obviously quarters are going to be better. Well, the one thing you're paying for with the Rangers is that stalk. The ability that you can't see them and shoot them using artillery or spirit leech spam them from early on. Uh, they, they give you that added ability that you basically can't see them until you're up in the front line. But Corners here are way more durable, very good units in general. I, I more, more people bring Rangers, I think, but I, I do like Corners in certain matchups. They certainly have their place. Uh, Corners are great weapons, uh, just to not use, in my opinion, for the extra 50 gold cost. Especially when you're getting better in the game, you realize that um, cost efficiency is very high, and 50 gold is actually a, a good amount. That can be the difference between you taking a rune or not taking a rune. Uh, especially if you've got like two of them, that could be a hundred gold cost. That is the cost of a rune. So um, the reason you bring the great weapons is the difference in advantage is that they bring armor piercing. They have slightly better stats and you have a good amount of armor piercing. But in my opinion, if you've got, if they need to have to use that armor piercing in the front line, or for example, if they're going to, if you're bringing them for the reason that they can protect themselves better, then I think you've lost the battle already. If they've already punched through your front line and they've gone to your Corollas and you've brought Corollas are great weapons to look after themselves because they're going to go into melee combat, then they, they're they not going to be doing their job anyway. They're going to get way more value from their range rather than fighting them in melee combat. So I think for the gold efficiency, Corollas are always going to be better. And then we can move on to some big units. So we're going to be bringing in the Iron Drakes next. I like the Iron Drakes and then we'll leave uh, one range unit for last. So we have normal Iron Drakes. These are going to be flamethrowers. Really fun. Anti-infantry. Fire damage. are very good up against regeneration. So all regening units have a negative 25% to uh, fire damage. And they also cause burns, which is a negative 8 leadership. Truckloads of missile strength as well. So they're very, very good here. And you can go through all those stats in your own time. But a uh, little bit low on the range, but they're very good support. So they have fire resistance, 70%. 25% uh, magic, 35% uh, magic resistance. Sorry, because of the armor, uh, they're they're very good in general. Um, you can see them uh, against factions that have low leadership, Skaven, Greenskins. They could do quite well there. And uh, you obviously have the ROR here, which are these Scolder Guards. So we have fire damage for the Iron Drakes, and uh, a bit of a misconception here is the Scolder Guard. You'll see they actually have armor piercing. Most people think they have fire damage, but they don't because they actually fire steam rather than firing flame. But uh, they also have added uh, physical resistance, uh, fire and magics per usual, but they have lots of armor piercing. I, I never see these, and I don't think they're very good for their cost. The next are 250. I just, I just don't believe they're worth it. Uh, they lose missile strength. Um, they do gain range and other stats, which is based with increasing with gold chevrons anyway, but it's not particularly too great. The only thing that I ever see them against is green skins and black orcs. Yeah, I just don't value them. I don't think they're great, and I wouldn't particularly bring them. So Iron Drake Torhammer Torpedoes are a phenomenal unit. They are the best in the game for anti-large uh, missile infantry. Uh, they fire basically large torpedoes that have just so much anti-large. Uh, plus 24 anti-large, good armor piercing. Very limited on range, that is one of their uh, drawbacks, but as with all of these, 125 armor for all of them. Huge armor, good leadership. Um, they're very difficult 
a common strategy from the lizard men is, is rock drops on the back line range here for the dowie and as you can see 80 armor for the quarrelers 40 for the rangers thunder is 80 as well but 125 armor rock drops almost do nothing against them also they've got massive fire resistance and being that the rocks have a base fire damage which i don't quite understand why but uh, they negate a lot of that damage rock drops do do barely anything to them so in variable they're they're very very strong range units they're they have good resistance against like um, spells such as Spirit Leech, which is very good at removing ranged models or artillery. Um, they're very good anti-large. Drawback is a little bit low on range, and of course they're slow, and protecting them can be difficult. But anything such as big dragons or um, any sort of monsters, just any large monsters, they'll just delete them in seconds if you're not careful. They're very, very good uh, anti-large uh, chariot tools. And the last unit, which is probably my favourite here in the Dwarven roster, is going to be the Thunderers. Now, Thunderers invariably have a little bit lower range compared to the crossbows, and they do have a little bit of a problem with Arc of Fire. So they, they generally invariably fire straight, but it's straight and fast. So with, with most Quarreler shots, you can dodge a little bit. You, you can't dodge against Thunderers. Good armour piercing, and they're pretty okay melee combatants as well. They're, they're not brilliant, but they're okay. Uh, they have shields. They're good armor piercing, lots of ammunition, 145 range is pretty decent as well, and they're just almost good against anything. Very good lord and hero snipers, very good chariot snipers, cavalry snipers, elite infantry snipers. They are exceptionally good in general. The only thing they lack, of course, is that immu uh, is, uh, immune to psychology and also that um, stalk, so they can get taken care of. So invariably here, a very good and a versatile missile infantry core, which you can pick quite a lot from here. But as you can see, they're all starting to have the same weaknesses. They're slow, um, either melee attack, but they have, they have a very, very good variety here. But we're going to move on here to the war machines or the flying war machines, which are going to be the gyrocopters. So gyrocopters are exceptional, but of course they have massive weaknesses. They're flying, so things like Tempest, and they also have very low model count. So we're going to have one here for the gyro bombers, and for the gyrocopters we'll have three. So taking out a single model is huge. And you know, netting them and shooting them is something that is, is very easily done. But they are super fast here. We, um, we do have 105 speed and 90s for the gyro bombers. Um, so they're very difficult to catch. Uh, they all come here with the gyro bombers. Uh, we also have the special one here as well for the gyro bomber bombs. They're very good anti-infantry explosions, really good at dealing with... So the gyro bombers here are very good at dealing with uh, mid-tier to uh, uh, elite. So they do very, very good uh, anti-elite infantry. And the gyrocopters are very good against cheaper and mid-tier infantry. As we can see here, the gyrocopters have shots, which are going to be anti-infantry. Uh, it's a little bit more steam fire. Um, poor accuracy in general, but uh, they're very good, cheap anti-infantry tools that fly in the sky. And if your opponent hasn't built for them, they do have good armor, good durability. They're very quick. As long as your micro is on top as well, they, they can do some really nice stuff. You can see they have low melee defense. So if they do go down to the floor to fight, because they do have 30 melee attacks, so they're not terrible. But if they go down on the floor, they, they can die invariably very quickly. So... They're okay. Uh, I do almost indefinitely prefer the Brimstone Guns. They do cost an extra 100. They have imbued fire damage. Uh, they are anti-large, armor-piercing, much better accuracy um, in general. Same speed, same stats, etc. I, I just prefer them. Um, they're much better single-entity snipers, anti-large snipers, elite infantry snipers such as Black Hawks. Very good at removing Black Hawks, whilst Gyrocopters are much cheaper infantry like Goblins, etc. And then we can move on to the gyro bombers. Now we get two, we get two bombs here per gyrocopter, so you get two abilities to drop bombs on infantry, which just requires some micro. Uh, but with the gyro bombers, they have a phenomenal amount of missile strength. So 1,174, and also has the nice slow. So for example, if we have two manticles in the sky, they're very, very quickly, uh, very quick. Sorry, at 90 speed, so they will catch gyro bombers. But if we shoot them there with that slow, let's say we bring two gyro bombers, you'll shoot one manticore, drop the other one, shoot again, and you can invariably keep moving and shooting, moving and shooting, moving and shooting, and then you should, in theory, be able to take out the manticore without taking any damage. Uh, they have nice bombs, I believe. I believe it's up to five bombs. So it's 11 bombs on this one, and the ROR is five, but it's a greater strength, I think. Yeah, so it's a large explosion. Yeah, so it's five there and 11 for the normal one. Um, as you said, good magic resistance, like base for the dwarves, but they're still very susceptible to Spirit Leech. Spirit Leech, of course, will delete one model first, take all of the health from one model, and then move on to the next one. So 
you've got to be careful with nets and spirit leech and armor piercing arrows so for example bringing these units up against the uh, dark elves with spirit leech and all their cheap units of armor piercing range can be pretty painful it can be done it can be done and they've also got to fly up against harpies as well harpies are relatively cheap they come in mass numbers and of course there's only three here and one so if you bring four units of these you're going to have 12 and then 13 if you bring a gyro bomb if you've got 13 units to shoot and you've got hundreds of harpies to kill so there's a good counter there these are very easily countered unfortunately but if we go with the ROR, it's going to have an insane missile strength. Very good at deleting all single entities and monsters, as are the rest. And uh, good leadership tools, etc. With actually 50 melee attack, so with that charge bonus, that 30 charge bonus with that 50 melee attack, they can actually swoop in after they've used all their ammunition and their bombs. They can actually get that nice charge bonus. They keep swooping down and attacking infantry over time. So you can actually utilize them in the end stage for that as well. But they're not excellent for it, but they can certainly do that. Those there, and with the Dwarves and one of the tactics, as I talked about, uh, it's sort of all in or nothing, or, or as I like to call it, all out or lose. Um, you, you invariably see a, what we call a Royal Dowie Air Force, which is you bring pretty much as many, ra uh, as many flying range as you can. So what you'll normally see is something like, something like this, or something like, this is my most common, I like this. This is uh, invariably very good up against green skins, or... Tomb Kings, this is exceptional against. Um, this is often what you'll see, but you can see that's a lot of your cost out of 12,400. You've now got to factor in uh, a Lord, and then you've got to factor in, uh, say, a Hero, and then I've got 4,000 to now build my army. So, whatever it might be that I want to do, and, and I don't have any range here, so I haven't got any range. So, it is quite expensive. So, when you're going there, you're going all out because you could just bring one or two. But essentially, if if you do catch your opponent unaware with all of that mass um, air force there, you can you can automatically be a win for you sometimes. And then we can move on to the artillery. So we'll start with bolt throwers, and invariably here, artillery is the best in the game with the dwarves. It is the most accurate, and you'll for the most part get uh, higher levels of damage output from these artillery pieces than anything else in the game. So from the bolt throwers, uh, pretty cheap, anti-large, armor piercing. Moderate range 340 is not huge, but they're so cheap that I've seen some people just spam them like five units of spamming them just to deal with cavalry uh, Single entities or even just mass elite infantry. I've just seen them being used to okay effect I don't normally bring them and they're not particularly common, but I have seen it used uh, Grudge throwers are, are decent good anti-infantry tools 440 range good armor piercing But almost always you're gonna see the ROR and the reason you're going to see the ROR, uh, much better stats there on the missile strength, etc. And also the leadership, which is quite important, especially when you're having an artillery duel. But the most reason you will be seeing the Goblobber is for this, the Discourage ability. Now, what you can do is you can partner that up with other Discourage abilities, such as the Iron Drakes. So you can have that negative 8 on top of that negative 16 for negative 24 money defense, uh, 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 negative leadership. This, this can add up and actually just really allow units to get broken in seconds with that damage on top of them the negative leadership can just really shatter units nice and quickly that's why you see these uh you'll see the goblobber against a, a faction such as skaven greenskins all these lowly um leadership um factions then we move on to the cannons i think the cannons are my favorite in general i think they're the most used 400 to 40 range good armor piercing uh the good up against other artillery pieces they're very good anti-artillery they're very good against cavalry good against large single entity heroes and lords and single entity monsters uh they just have so much utilization and also allows the dwarves to obey the attacking rule in a bit of a box where they can attack with artillery uh, and, and sit back a little bit more but what most people do try and do sometimes is try and see if they can out artillery the dwarfs, which for the most part, two cannons will deal with the majority of other artillery. When you have a bit of an artillery off and then whoever wins, you then invariably have to push whoever has artillery left. Otherwise, the artillery will get its full value and you'll destroy a lot of units before the fight lines are even engaged. Then we are going to have organ guns and flame cannons. Now, two different separate entities here. A little bit lower range on the organ guns, but they have an exceptional damage output. 300 range, 334 armor piercing missile strength. Uh, very good indeed. So if you compare it here to the cannons, they're going to have an extra 121 missile strength. But they do lose that range. They have more ammunition. Uh, they are just very good. 
They are the basically cannons, but better, but less range. So there's a bit of a trade-off there. And then we have flame cannons. Uh, even less range, the, the least amount of range, but they have a massive 556 missile strength. They also have burnt uh, flaming attacks as well. Uh, they're, they're exceptional damage and anti-infantry dealers. Um, good utilizations here for the flame cannons. You, you don't see them or the organ guns used at all, really, because they're way too expensive. But uh, they're very good up against undead. Um, very good up against uh, vampire counts, for example. Very good with uh, grave guard, great weapons, or normal grave guard, or the sternsmen, like elite infantry that um, can be uh, splashed upon there with uh, all the nice splash animations from the flame cannon and its firing. So invariably, that's a bit of that's quite a lot of detail there for the dwarf. So I hope you've been able to digest that. Um, invariably, when you are having an army set up, you'll be able to hopefully have a bit more of an idea about what you want to bring and why and how it might move a little bit better together here. Normally if you go Thoric on his anvil, you might see something along the lines like this. And then you might see a Master Engineer. And for him, going wide is quite nice. So you could see something like this. Then we could see some Thunderers, a couple of Slayers for the anti-large. Uh, something like this could be fine, or if you wanted to bring in an artillery piece, you could take a cannon, you've got 200 gold left. You could just sort of mix it around where and if, or however you wanted to. Um, sometimes you might not bring this, you might bring this, you've got an extra 550. You could bring in some Dwarf Warriors, we've got 96 to spend. Maybe take an extra rune, it's a bit expensive, but you know, you know what I mean. You can bring in sort of whatever it is you want to bring in, or you can bring in, say, any of these items you might particularly fancy. So the last thing I didn't touch on, I just remembered right now, is the firing of Tori. Uh, this is uh, a very nice item here for the dwarfs with the Master Engineer. It's actually very good with its magic damage and fire, very good up against ethereal units and just clear clearing out really cheap chaff with low armor. Think about it as a tear-shaped magic attack, which is the same as dealing with blasting charges. Anything with low armor or, for example, it might be ethereal, f firing a Tori is exceptional. So... That's the only time you might see two, uh, two Master Engineers, if you're going to have two firing of Tories. So, yeah, so something like this might be uh, a pretty decent build. Uh, with Thoric with this Rune of Dune, you're going to give lots of melee attack increase along. You've got good range to support a cannon to ensure they're going to come to you. If they bring any sort of horses, you've got Slayers. Um, and you've got all those good things as well. You've got flash bombs, two slows. You've also got an increase on that melee attack in the front line and speed if you want it. Um, and you've got the Rune of Doom. And also the Locust of Power. So all those amazing things here that you can bring for the Dwarfs. That uh, this this could be a good start army for you guys. This is um, this is this is an army that I would very comfortably bring for myself. And I, you know I've got some got some money here. You know if I went, oh, I need a little bit more. You have some good armor piercing from the Thunderers and Thunderers and your cannons. Uh, for the most part, where your damage output is going to come from. So actually, is uh, my rule of thumb is, is as long as you can always keep at least one unit of Thunderers alive, the game is always on. You can always win that game as long as one of your Thunderers are alive because you can always just keep giving them ammunition. So as long as you can always protect one, you can always win. But um, these guys will, will stand the test. So what will happen here is the Mines of Blast and Chargers will deal with the cheap infantry. They'll then fight against a little bit more of an expensive infantry with their armor piercing. Um, they'll reduce their vigor, making them a bit exhausted, a bit tired. And then they'll have to fight up against the Longbeards. And then you also have some Dwarf Rides and Slayers to hold the back line to maybe to protect the cannon or protect the Thunderers against any cavalry etc so um, yeah that could be quite a nice tight box build there but of course when you're playing with the dower you do also have to take all sorts of maps into considerations where we have um, hills etc to take into consideration for whether you're going to be using cannons or artillery such as grudge throwers obviously cannons are going to fire pretty straight so are thunderers whilst if you go with say a grudge thrower instead and then let's say we bring some rangers otherwise but let's say we want some more armor piercing, so we'll bring something like this. As an example, of course, I've gone over there, but we can we can make adjustments. This is, you know, these these are certain items that you might want to consider um, when it comes down to who you're playing, what map you're on. These these are things that we will talk about in the future and some considerations you might have to make. But other than that, guys, um, of course, uh, if you have enjoyed this, please smash the like button. I'd really appreciate that. That would really help me know if you did enjoy this, if you thought this was helpful, and if you'd like me to make more. 
um, as well. Uh, leave a comment down below for any other questions you may have here about the divorce. Hopefully this is a good entry video where you can see or have a bit more of an insight into the divorce and how you can utilize them and maybe just a bit more base knowledge about the faction in general. Also, if you are new here, think about subscribing. That would really help towards those 1,000 subscribers I'm trying to obtain so I can become a partner here with CA and also YouTube and become a little bit more financially independent with this process. And you can also drop down to the description where you'll be able to find my Discord and you'll be able to join there, see all of the other content with the single player stuff, multiplayer, leagues, tournaments, all of the awesome things I have coming forward here in the future. You'll be able to vote there, put all your video ups, all your replays, so you can see me cast those as well. But other than that, I've been your boy Logic. I hope you've enjoyed this Dowie video, and I'll be seeing you very soon for a new video or live stream. Take care.